morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Buenos dias. Um, happy to be with all of you here. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Carolina, muchas gracias por tu introducción. Thank you so much for your introduction. I'd like to um, start with extending the acknowledgement um, that Carolina um, so beautifully shared with us this morning. I'd like to extend this acknowledgement to all the lands in Turtle Island or Aviayala, as the Kuna people from Panama and Colombia call these lands. So let's, let's just think now about all the lands from the southern tip of the south to the northern tip of the north in what we call America today and um, um, extend this acknowledgement um, as being um, many of us guests in these lands and um, honor the indigenous peoples who were here, are here, will be here. Thank you. Um, we're going to, um, um, this, this is, we have two hours for this meeting and um, I'd like to explain that the way I'd like to engage with you today is as follows. I would like to um, go over chunks of content and then I'm going to pause and ask you to connect, sit with what you're hearing and then um, see if there are any reflections or questions that are coming up and Carolina is going to be checking you know, where, where you're at. Um, so um, because this is a, two hours is a long time to do something online, it's very important that we pause, we check with our bodies, we check how things are sitting with us so that we can connect and create a rhythm of connection, uh, even if we're doing this online, but create a rhythm of collection, connection with the sounds of our words, with the feelings in our bodies, with the thoughts we're having, the reflections we're having as we're hearing this content. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, I, um, I'm going to start, let me just share my screen right now. And uh, hold on a second, here we are. Okay. So um, this morning here in Portland, we're gathering to have uh, reflect a little bit on how, uh, in what ways, or what do colonization and decolonization have to do with sexual violence and explore um, how uh, liberation healing would look like. So um, the first thing I'd like to invite you to think about is something that we call point of departure. So how we start to think about a problem or an issue or a topic matters because that sets some parameters about how we're gonna go about it and where we're going to end up. It's gonna have some influence, right? So for example, if we start to think about love from a religious perspective, it's gonna bring some parameters to how we think about it. If we think about it from a spiritual perspective, it, there's other parameters we can, we come in place. If we think about it from a humanist perspective, all the parameters will come in place. So where we start matters. Um, and in particular, when we're talking about sexual violence and colonization, this really matters where we start. So um, the first thing in where I start in terms of thinking about um, sexual violence in the realm of what I do family therapy, couples therapy, individual therapy, the world of counseling and therapy. Um, I think of myself as a part of the colonial history of the Americas. Hmm? I'm not a detached observer. I'm not outside of the history of what has happened in these lands and to all our peoples. Um, I am part of it, I'm in it. I'm the product of it. So if I start thinking about sexual violence from that perspective, it's going to have a very different perspective than if I detach myself and think that I am an outside observer and that has never touched my life or the life of my ancestors. Hmm? Um, now, this matters because the way in which knowledge has been produced for decades and decades and decades 
um, and, and has dominated how we work, the way we work in psychology and counseling and psychotherapy has involved a certain level of detachment from what we study uh, in, in search for of something called neutrality. And neutrality is impossible. We know that from physics. What's most important is to have multipartiality. That is to be able to see various perspectives, different perspectives, and to find a place for all the different knowledges that we create so that they can all be visible and there can be coexistence and cooperation. So um, a big problem with um, understanding um, the understandings we have about us and in this in relation to this topic and other topics, when we think about it in a detached manner as something outside of us, is that it makes invisible who is producing that knowledge and how it is produced. Mm -hmm. And this is why, or historically, um, there have been so many movements by female identified people, by people of color, by queer people, um, and later, lately, by nature to say, hey, I'm here and my life, my issues are not represented in the ways you have created knowledge. Because knowledge has been dominated by a patriarchal way of thinking and mostly by male uh, uh, identified people who generally um, also are white or look white mm -hmm. or are part of the construction of whiteness wherever that is happening in the world. So there has been a process of exclusion and selection that has created this very rigid hierarchies of what is um, valuable knowledge, what is less valuable knowledge. And then uh, we all end up having uh, been socialized into valuing uh, knowledge according to these systems. Hmm? So, but when we situate ourselves, when we situate ourselves in terms of what we call those social locations, the knowledge looks different and it has to be different because it becomes relevant to our experience. And it's not just an individual experience, it's a collective experience. Colonization is not the individual spirit experience of Pilar Hernandez, it's a collective experience of millions of people, not only for the colonized, but also for the colonizers, right? It's a collective experience that needs to be seen and acknowledged. So um, I am an immigrant. Um, I was born in Colombia. I came here as an adult. My pronouns are she, hers. I um, identify as female, I'm heterosexual. Right now I'm um, able-bodied. Um, and um, as um, we'll talk later about mestizaje, part of my um, life journey has involved finding and reconnecting with the indigenous and African roots that I do have in my background that have been made invisible um, throughout um, hundreds of years of colonization. But mestizos are that mix that bring about the wound of coloniality. Um, I'll explain this a little bit more later. So um, situa situating who we are and situating the knowledges we're creating is also uh, important that it, because it brings opportunity. When we are open and we invite and are aware also the privileges that we have, we can use those privileges in a positive way. We can be more responsible. So this is not about creating guilt, shame. It's about visibility. It's about coexisting collaboration and accountability, showing up with equity. Um, so um, that also has to do with understanding that we always speak from a particular lo location within power structures. What that means is that, as an example for me, um, I'm a professor at a university mm -hmm. and there is a certain hierarchy that um, it's in existence there that um, allows me to uh, be a speaking in this place right now and be doing a, a number of things that I can do right now. Mm -hmm. um, so this journey, this academic journey in my life has brought a lot of pain and sacrifice and at the same time has brought about some privileges. Mm -hmm. So um, 
locating and making obvious what those structures are matter. Mm -hmm. Where we speak, who we speak, who are we speaking with? What relationships are, who do we represent? Mm -hmm. So I know that where I stand now, uh, given the social capital I have, and like I said, the affiliation I have, there is a level of responsibility and a level of power that I hold in these structures. Um, that to me is important to be channeled in the most positive way possible. Okay, so let's just pause one second, just take a deep breath and just check in with you, with your body, how are you doing right now? And just allow yourself to feel how what I just said is sitting with you right now. And if you can, take a couple of deep, deep breaths and slowly breathe in and out and just land here. So I invite you to land in this virtual space where I'm now as part of um, situating myself, want to call in the relationship we all have with all beings, all beings in this planet. We're all in relationship with all other beings in this planet. And as part of locating myself in a power structure as a human being over everybody else here in this planet, I want to acknowledge all my relationships with all beings, with all life. Okay. So um, next idea is colonization generates trauma. Of course, we know that colonization has generated a lot of trauma uh, simply because of all the physical violence that has occurred throughout the centuries and all the many ways in which oppression has um, occurred for many communities. And where oppressors and oppressed are all involved in the trauma of colonization. And some obviously feel it much more than others. Uh, but we are all wounded by that. So what happens is that one of the impacts of that is that over time, we all have had to accommodate, to survive, to find ways to um, overcome and also live with the impact of all that trauma. So for both those who have um, been victims of violence and also who have violated others or those who mostly violate others, this involves a huge level of dissociation. We have to leave parts of ourselves that are very painful to see, very painful to acknowledge so that we can continue living. And this becomes problematic. It becomes problematic because then we don't acknowledge, we don't repair, we don't work on reparation. Mm -hmm. We go through the route of things don't exist, we deny them. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what I want to invite with thinking about um, colonization and decolonization is an acknowledgement to honor to bring back balance, to bring back the bond, the connection, the grace that we need to heal the past, the present, and create a different future. Um, now, um, some um, um, Latin American scholars um, like Arturo Escobar or um, Tijano Amignolo talk about the concept of coloniality. And I'm bringing this because um, this is a really important point in thinking about this therapeutically. I will illustrate this later. And is that, yes, colonization basically suppressed and erased, you know, entire populations and cultures and basically um, involved the systemic suppression of subordinated cultures and knowledges by the dominant Eurocentric paradigm of modernity. Um, however, at the same time that that happened, there has been throughout time an emergence of knowledges and practices resulting from that experience of colonization. And that's what they call coloniality. coloniality. Mm -hmm. 
So there is an emergence of knowledge and practices at the margins that has the potential to endanger, sorry, engender distinct alternatives, fostering a pluriverse of cultural organizations. And um, this, this is what I see, for example, in terms of the flourishing of what mestizo means, or in terms of the flourishing of what queer means, and embracing um, thinking that is less and less binary, and seeing ourselves in different ways. Mm -hmm. So um, again, the point with coloniality is that coloniality, the result, the process parallel to colonization, generates both trauma and resilience, and vicarious trauma and vicarious resilience. So there is that pain, but there is also the emergence of knowledges at the margins of all of us that have working throughout the years to find our voices, to find the, the practices, the knowledges, the ways of being that are more resonant with our ancestry. Those of us who have been working on making invisible for ourselves and for others who we are, who our ancestors are. So um, when we're talking about colonization and colonialism, we're talking mostly about um, an extension of political and economic power. Um, we're talking about the creation of a race, gender system, and um, the hierarchy that most of us live today. Um, but coloniality results from the wounds of that those processes of colonization. And um, what it does is that allows us to draw uh, different paths and to enunciate other knowledges after having recognized inequality and accepted that this is a wound inflicted by coloniality. One second. Yeah. So um, indigenous, in this process of colonization, indigenous, black, and women of color have often been the primary focus of sexual violence because of their capacity to give birth um, and because control over reproduction is essential in destroying people. If the women of a nation are um, not disproportionately killed, the nation's population can always rebound. So um, colonization has brought about a lot of violence. That's how it started. And we still 500 plus years later live with the impact of that violence because there is a transmission of trauma. There is a transmission of adaptation to that trauma. And there is these hierarchies in place that value people based on color, class, uh, nation of origin, gender, sexual orientation. And um, those who have been, who were colonized, who were conquered in Abiyayala, um, indigenous women, were seen as sexual objects. And as sexual objects were the objects of sexual violence. And that still goes on today um, with children and young people of color. And then um, Africans were brought to these lands as slaves and the same thing happened. Mm -hmm. So um, colonization um, broke the egalitarian nature of some societies where women had a spiritual, political and military power where they had a place, right? So today what we see in many places in Latin America is that um, that patriarchal system is what is in place, regardless of who is enacting it. It could be people of color, it could be mestizos, it could be actually indigenous peoples. Uh, that patriarchal oppressive system is in place and that violence continues to happen. So, um, One of the results of colonization is that BIPOC bodies uh, have become justifi justifiable sites of violence and domination. So um, uh, 
um, let's think about again what this means in terms of um, thinking about these this concepts of colonization and coloniality. Um, um, Argentinian philosopher Amaya Lugones introduced uh, the concept of uh, systemic um, gender um, oppression in, in, in the context of coloniality, arguing that um, both race and gender are necessary to understand how violence are enacted upon women in the global south be it a state sanction or uh, be it in terms of knowledge or be in terms of uh, physical violence. And when she's talking about Global South, we're talking about, you know, not just the lo location in, let's say, in South America, but the Global South is, you know, all of us who have roots in the Global South and who are rash racialized uh, uh, persons or seen as racialized persons and treated in, in such way. And because this system of um, power has been put in place, um, BIPOC women, sexual minorities, gender minorities are um, justifiable as sites of violence or dominations because a part of this system has involved the um, empowering and um, domination of a small group of people um, who um, want to have a certain uh, world order where um, they are more, we are less. And this comes about in different ways. I know as I'm talking about this, it seems it perhaps is going to seem like, oh, this is, this is too much, this is too extreme. But if you think about the experiences that you might have had, I certainly have had, um, about um, how I'm seen, for example, in, um, in many social contexts, including professional contexts, or you know, um, where I work, um, it makes sense. So I'm gonna give you an example. When I'm in um, a social context where white is mostly dominated by white people and they have no real, real connection and habit of connection with people from other um, races and other genders. Hmm? And all they know in terms of relationship, for example, with Latinos, is that Latinos are their uh, garden uh, keepers and their cleaning uh, service people. That's the only way they know in terms of relationship, right? And the prejudice is going to come out at some point because you don't have the practice of being in relationship with somebody like me in a way that is respectful, in a way in which you actually see me as a human being equal as you are. Hmm? You don't have that practice. And when we have uh, students, students of color, who come to schools that are mostly white, have been completely socialized in students that are white, and they see a professor of color it means a lot. It's the first time that they have a role model of somebody like them who is in that position. Mm -hmm. So my point with all this is that uh, there are all these different ways that are not as painful as before, but there are all these different ways in which today we continue to enact and live within these hierarchies of being valued in different ways, being treated and um, being the object of different levels of assaults and aggressions in so many different ways that have to do with that, with the, the impact of, of colonization, right? And now, like I said before, there is the emergence of um, coloniality. Um, and um, the emergence of alternative knowledges. Let me pause for a second. Um, I'm just, I want you to take a deep breath and I'm just gonna check my slides here for a minute.
Okay, here we are. <laughs> so, um, as a result of slavery and colonialism, uh, women and female identified people were simultaneously hypersexualized and desexualized, and their autonomy of their bodies and their reproductive options then their sexual sexualities were consistently determined by dominant views of the ruling class. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, in Mexico, after the fall of the Aztec empire, uh, the Spanish crown quickly set up their colonial government in Mexico. Uh, during the Spanish rule of Mexico, the indigenous people who survived the pandemic of diseases brought by the Europeans became enslaved. This happened really all over Latin America. Um, however, because indigenous peoples were being massacred in large natural numbers, it resulted in an increase in demand from, for free labor. And this is how um, the uh, horrendous slave tri trade from uh, Africa occurred. So um, children uh, were born out of the rape of uh, enslaved um, African women and indigenous women. Mm -hmm. And um, what the Spanish decided to do was to implement the caste system, the peeling the societal structure of Mexico. This also happened in Colombia. So, um, and the Spaniards designated non-European um, base culture groups, such as African and indigenous uh, Mexicans and other Latin Americans as irrational beings. So um, when, when you, create this idea that um, you are not as human as I am and you are an object that I can use and violate, uh, then you can create this, this, continue creating these worldviews that continue to justify how I can use you, how I can abuse you. So the Spanish caste system was based on a hierarchical system of social status that was practiced in Spain around the concept of limpieza de sangre or purity of blood, in which the genealogical line of each family was carefully and sometimes legally monitored. The key difference between Spain's hierarchical system and the Spanish caste system in Mexico was race. In Spain, the societal status was based on the economic and religious status of a person, while the caste system became uh, here racialized and um, granted social status based on the various uh, ways races were mixed, right? And, and this was basically trying to figure out what to do with uh, European indigenous and African uh, people here. Um, so they created this structure, I'm sure you know what this is about, whether it's mestizo, mulatto, blah, 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 all these names that they created, but it was basically to make sense of how we organize them as we have created here and, and how we dominate different people, divide and conquer. So El Sistema de Casta, uh, this caste system became essential in establishing um, Spanish white supremacy in Latin America, in Mexico, for example. Um, and they, the Spanish saw this classification of racial identities as a necessity to maintain order and ensure free labor um, and the preservation of wealth that they, the wealth that they had stolen. So um, it also helped to separate communities and, um, and to um, um, create a lot of divisiveness between different people of color. Mm -hmm. and, and you see this today in different ways that remains in these in, in families, in, in, in Latinx families where um, you know, my family members who are lighter um, sometimes have more privileges than family members who um, are um, darker. Um, with separating communities from one another, also um, different forms of treatment to, towards each group happened. Um, so lighter people tended to be more valued than darker people. That, that, action, that actually was institutionalized. And um, also indigenous peoples represented uh, potential gumpers to Catholicism. And over time, communities began to assimilate to the newly and forcibly enforced social order. Establishing a racial order and hierarchy created uh, a desire to be dissociated from blackness and darker features, 
while placing greater value in whiteness. Um, did I hear a voice and do I need to pause? Okay, I'm going to continue. <laughs> okay, so um, what I want you to understand as a point of this is that this, the impact of these, um, the, this racism for hundreds of years that we see sometimes in families we work with today is not a thing that happened now. It's a thing that has been taught and that we've been socialized in for years and years and years, for decades, for hundreds of years, um, in which um, this valuing of lighter and more and closer to whatever is deemed um, capitalistic, Catholic, Christian, European, uh, in the ways they see it, um, is more valued. Therefore, um, people try to dissociate from the things that are less valued. And this is why we see today in so many places that indigenous children don't want to learn their language. They want to learn the dominant language mm -hmm. because um, they understand that that is more valued. So um, after independence from the Spain, um, racial stereotypes persisted throughout, uh, through the construction of national identity in Latin America. These erased, for example, in Mexico, blacks, me black Mexicans from the national population um, and, and in other countries, uh, it, it erased black uh, Argentinians and black Uruguayans, for example, we rarely see uh, that there's actually um, black Argentinians, black Uruguayans. Um, but in Mexico, the national identity of, of Mexico also attempted to erase indigenous peoples by valuing the Spanish colonizer of the mestizo, um, uh, I'm sorry, by valuing the Spanish colonizer side of the mestizo to a greater extent. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is where we are, right? So for example, in Colombia, the majority of the people are mestizo, right? I, I don't know, it's like 85%, something like that. Uh, that's the majority of the population. But why? Why, partly why it's because that the Spanish side of the colonizer, that mestizo is the one who ended up being more valued. You know, and here we are. So by creating national identity um, and people's cultures and traditions become overshadowed and erased from the hegemonic identity. When we create these national identities, um, such as, you know, Mestizo or Colombian or Mexican, oftentimes what comes with that um, and needs to be scrutinized is who is that an identity covering? is it? Hmm? Um, think about um, when we, you are, um, if, you know, when sometimes people um, who are uh, U.S. citizens who are Americans are in other countries and they are BIPOC and people from other countries um, don't see them as Americans because they are not white. <laughs> and for them, the, the person who, the construction they have of American is a white person. So um, Mexico's, in, in terms of Mexico, again, Mexico's long colonial history of violence, dehumanization and erasure of ancestors created a disconnect to traditional ways of being. And the internalization of the colonial violence inflicted on people shapes the ways in which we interact or people interact with one another and the world. And as it happened there, it has happened in Colombia and in uh, other places in Latin America. So let's just pause one second, take a deep breath, and just, just allow yourself to notice what you're feeling right now with no judgment. And just, just see whatever is coming up, any resistance you're having, any thoughts you're having, and just notice them with no judgment. And let's, let's just see them and feel them. Hmm. 
So why this matters when we're talking about clinical practice, social work practice? Why, why do we care about these things? Well, when it comes to um, Latinx, Latinos, Latin Americans, uh, because of this mestizaje, you have all these complexities around color um, and colorism. Mm -hmm. You have all these complexities about the ways in which oppression and uh, privilege are in intertwined in the interpersonal relationships of families and friends and communities. Mm -hmm. so, so it matters because um, oftentimes these are clinical conversations. This is not a book I'm reading, it's not a discourse that somebody has, it's actually um, lived, enacted in our bodies. So, um, I'm going to continue to use Mexico as an example. Um, and like I said, this applies to other places in Latin America, like Colombia. Um, so, um, uh, mestizaje has oppressive and liberating means. And let's say in the case of Mexico, as Mexico's national identity became established on the principles of mestizaje and centering of whiteness, the colonized body was followed by the next phase of colonization. And um, what this has to do with, uh, a lot had to do with colorism. Hmm? creating a national identity around something we call mestizo, um, definitely um, in Colombia, that um, marginalizes people who are darker. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the biggest problems with this um, issue being mestizo is that um, it also, um, um, allowed a dominant discourse in which people think that they are free from being racist because we're a mixed race. Mm -hmm. That we're free from racism. Uh, so it's a process in which darker indigenous black has been erased and in which that erasure means like, well, no, well I'm not racist because you know, I'm the mixture of all those things. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what that creates, again, it's a dominant identity that um, uh, marginalizes and oppresses all these other, uh, all the other identities and all other people who have other backgrounds and who um, are not a part of the, the, let's say, the colonial side of the mestizaje. So um, what we see in, in, um, is that um, there is this colonial mentality, right? That is a form of internalized oppression resulting from colonization in which the colonizer is believed to be superior to the colonized. And there's this colonial mentality that affects all of us, right? Where we value certain things more than others. So this, the problem is that this has been passed down from generations since the colonial period. Over time, the narratives and the stereotypes constructed of us by hegemonic powers um, have helped create an inferiority complex. Hmm? Um, you might have heard in, in clinical practice many times the experiences of um, how um, children who are darker um, try to scrub themselves the, the, the color of their skin with, with um, a sponge with, with soap. Um, I've seen that many times. Mm -hmm. Well, this has to do, not because anybody has told them anything, it's because it's out there everywhere, what's valued and what's not valued. Mm -hmm. So um, if you come here as an immigrant and you are a mestizo um, uh, who has class marginalized, um, who are trying to look for a better future and you're dark and you speak Spanish or perhaps you speak uh, your bilingual and you speak an indigenous language and Spanish and you clearly don't look like anything and you don't behave a lot like um, people in the larger culture. Um, it's easy to um, start to think that, uh, well, I'm not like you and what I have is not valued. 
So I start to feel like I'm less and that I have to accommodate. Um, so to combat these feelings of inferiority, the oppressed continuously strives to assimilate in order to compensate for their lack of whiteness. And um, this brings about a process of dehumanization. And this dehumanization occurs very clearly um, in families um, when children are you know, valued in different way and some children are actually um, abused. Okay, um, let me go to this slide and then I'm going to pause and see what comments and questions you have. Um, so um, what does this have to do with sexism? Well, gender and color, gender and race are connected and we have um, ways in which this hierarchy has been in place, in which um, there is institutionalized sexism, in which labor, for example, is set and valued in different ways, depending on whether you're female or male identified. Then there is interpersonal sexism in regards to, for example, traditional labor uh, at home and um, the many ways in which female identified people end up having to carry much more labor than male identified people. And then the ways in which we also think that we deserve to carry more and we take much more load than others uh, because we think we deserve that. Okay, so um, this interpersonal and internalized sexism usually um, it is seen in terms of caregiving. Um, female identified people usually, not all the time, but usually as being the caregivers for everybody. They are, we are the cultural bearers. So um, we carry the, the weight of bringing, you know, our traditions to the next generation. We are the ones doing the, all the rituals, right? And we're also the ones taking care for not only the children, but our elders. It also comes, uh, uh, we see it in terms of discipline and violence, as you usually see um, girls, female identified people, oftentimes in families are treated differently, are treated harsher than male identified people. Not always, but you know, as a norm that happens. Definitely, if um, a boy shows a, um, um, a difference in terms of um, being more, um, caring, more sensitive, more empathic, uh, that is the object of discipline. Uh, that behavior is the object of discipline. Um, submission is another way in which we see this interpersonal and internalized sexism. Um, we submit in many ways and we do it unconsciously sometimes. It's not only in our family relationships, we do it at work. We do it at work with, uh, with men so many times. We do it at work with people uh, who are um, higher up in the hierarchy and who probably were afraid of. And, and we attribute uh, much more power, power than they actually have. And with shame, thinking that we're less, thinking that we are not deserving. So many times at the core of um, a lot of these problems when I work clinically, um, what is at the very core is that sense of, I am not deserving of being loved, of, of being valued or being cared for. Okay, let me uh, pause here for a second and just see where we are at and connect with people here. Um, Carolina, do you have any comments or questions that people are sharing? Um, we have just one in here says uh, from Muriel. I didn't know that when I went to Senegal, they called me to a bob, which means white person, but I'm African descent on both sides. Um, this was a comment kind of a little while back in reference to Muriel, if you have anything to add. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, the construction of whiteness is not about color only. It has to do with color, but it's really not only about color, right? So um, for example, 
um, you would see, I'll give you a typical example of what happens in Colombia. Mestizos are the white people in Colombia because the European white population, even though it's at the top of the hierarchy, it's very small. Um, and there is a lot of, um, you know, people in power who are brown, let's say, look brown. So that's, that's the real whiteness there, right? So, and then there is this idea that we're not racist because, you know, I'm mestizo, so I have everything, so I have overcome all that. But then people go to other countries. Colombians go to other countries, let's say Spain or the US, and um, they think that the Spaniards and uh, white Americans or Americans are going to see them as white, but they don't. They say, no, you're a person of color. No, you're not white. Oh, big surprise. What do you mean I'm not white? No, you're not. For them, you're not, because it is a social construction. Hmm? And likewise, um, depending on what the social construction it is in different places in Africa, that idea of whiteness has to do with who is at the top of the hierarchy, who is better, and who is a, the racial, racialized other. Um, so this happens in many ways. It's like a big awake, awakening sometimes for people in terms of how we're perceived, the power relationships outside of um, our own countries, our own geographies. So let's take a deep breath. Let's just pause for a second and just sit with this. So in clinical practice, this matters because sometimes it's important to invite some of these conversations and help people understand the broader picture, that there is a broader picture that we're all a part of and that we're enacting some of these um, toxicities without even knowing it. And it helps us to externalize that this is something that we don't really need to keep on carrying, that doesn't belong to us, that we can live life in a different way. And, and it's important sometimes to have conversations about where this came from, so that we have more choice. So it's not that you created this pain internally, but it was created a long time ago and we've been carrying it and we can let it go and create all the ways of relating. You know? Of course, you know, we have to think about how we bring these conversations in therapy, how we invite them and think about readiness. Um, but inviting people to see the broader picture so that they have a different way, framework for what's happening interpersonally, it's very useful at the right time. Okay, uh, let me go back here and see where we are. Okay, so, so now what? Uh, we have this broad picture of um, you know, colonization and coloniality and, and some of the pains and ills that we're living with today and getting out of. So um, what can decolonization look like in therapy? What can we do now? How, what do we do with this, right? Um, to me, the point is not to, when I look at these things, is to me what is important is to see what I have in front of me, to honor the pain and to find for me, to find ways and rituals to let go of that so that I can pave the way to create a balanced, honoring, respectful, loving relationship with all beings and to allow that to happen um, in the therapeutic space that we can let go of what doesn't serve us anymore and, 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 and honor that it was there, but not, we don't have to keep carrying these things. So um, there is um, four things I wanna discuss uh, that might be helpful in terms of anchoring therapeutic processes, helping processes uh, via therapy, via social work. Um, I'm thinking about the concept of resilience uh, that I'll explain in a minute the specific concept of resilience. Um, the concept of Mepan, Mepantla by Gloria Saldua 
some thoughts from Mujerista therapy and um, testimonials and testimonial therapy. So um, when, um, when I'm thinking about resilience, this is how I think about resilience. And this is a way in which uh, Michael Unger, I invite you to read his work, um, has been super helpful in terms of helping me understand um, how I can connect the idea of coloniality, the emergence of knowledges at the margins that are uh, filled with hope, potential, possibility, and where many of us stand today in our lives and understanding how we can live in those spaces and open more space for other people to be in those spaces. So um, resilience is about understanding, uh, resilience in, in, in context of exposure to significant adversity involves examining the processes by which communities struggle, adapt, and navigate their way to a state of well-being, how they negotiate, recreate, and affirm their way of life. So um, when I, for example, think about the very painful migration processes that many of us have uh, endured uh, in these generations and in past generations and how we have been moving from, you know, one part of Avia Yala to another part of Avia Yala and being uprooted and then having to move again and feeling like we have no place that were guests everywhere and, you know, since more than 500 years ago. Um, I'm also, um, I like to bring um, into a relational awareness um, how we have navigated, how we have negotiated, how we have recreated and affirmed ways of life that have allowed us to survive, to take care of each other um, to bring connection with the new peoples that we meet, um, to bring our children to um, places where they can also have a life. So um, resilience processes must be anchored in the multiple subjectivities of those who face adversities. It's not a one thing, it's not a trait. It's about the many ways in which we adapt and negotiate in a meaningful matter, in a matter that uh, attends to context, to social context. Um, embodied voices must be a part of the meaning making process along with access and opportunity for collective coping and an outlook to open possibilities. When I emphasize embodied voices, I am um, highlighting that um, we pay attention to the voice of the little ones, of the adolescents, of the adults, of everybody. And we pay attention to how we feel here and now. And we bring back connection to our bodies. Resilience is not a concept out there. It's about embodiment. So for, for example, think about adaptation and navigation in terms of how we embody well-being with what we eat and how we eat. Digestion and eating are very much connected with trauma and traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. And they are also, it's also connected a lot with resilience. So thinking about, this is an example of what embody means, embodiment, connection with where we are right now in the present, with this land. Um, so um, in spite of the many risk factors associated with race, class, gender, ability, age, and sexual orientation for Latinx communities, um, many authors uh, believe that the impact of traumatic experiences and pathways for resilience can coexist. That's what I hang on to. This is why I'm talking about colonization and decolonization and this concept of coloniality. Because yes, we live with the impact of traumatic experience. And at the same time, there are these pathways for resilience that coexist with that, like what happens with vicarious trauma and vicarious resilience. Um, adversity can unintentionally yield changes in oneself, others, and the world that may result adaptive and positive experience. 
when experiences of adversities in therapy are seen in social and historical context, it is possible to find interstices, borderlands, with potential and positive change over time. And then the processes of overcoming adversity are scaffolded and they evolve over time in the context of learning how to survive, adapt, and thrive. And let's pause for a second, let's take another deep breath. And before we talk about the planta, just bring your awareness about your own process of navigation and negotiation and resilience and just tap into one of them that has that you want to be grateful for right now. So take a deep breath and just think about your own resilience and one thing you want to be grateful for right now in terms of resilience in your life. The other concept, the second concept I want to bring to your awareness, um, and you might know this, uh, those of you who are familiar with the work of Gloria Saldua, is Nepantla. Nepantla is in a wild word that means in between space. So when I'm looking at decolonization, I'm looking at resilience, I'm looking at Nepantla. Nepantla. And Nepantla means in between spaces. So it involves transformation and this identification from existing beliefs, social structures, models of identity. It, 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 it's about going into these in-between spaces, borderland spaces, the spaces in which border knowledge and border identities are constructed, the gaps, the features, and silences um, that come about um, when there are overlapping border spaces and cultural representations. Um, and Saldua um, explained Nepantla like this. Um, she said, with Nepantla paradigm, I tried to theorize and articulate the dimensions of the experience of mestizas, uh, living in between overlapping and layered spaces of different cultures and social and geographical locations of events and realities psychological, sociological, political, spiritual, historical, creative, imagined. Mm -hmm. And today, uh, especially for those who um, live in Turtle Island um, and in certain parts, not everywhere, but in certain parts of certain island, uh, Turtle Island, uh, we uh, certainly have the possibility to inhabit these borderlands uh, a lot, a lot of the time, because of the overlapping of mestizo identities and queer identities and all the different ways in which new generations uh, want to name themselves and see themselves in different ways that are more resonant with who they want to be with their own experiences. So um, what does Nepantha look like in therapy? Um, see, bringing about these possibilities of um, spaces for uh, um, letting go of things that don't serve us and coming into these in-between spaces is not an easy thing to do because it's not just an intellectual endeavor. Like I said before, with resilience, resilience is embodied, but Nepantla is also embodied. Mm -hmm. It's not about being a concept out there. It has to be felt. It has to be experienced experience in our body, in our breath. Mm -hmm. Our capacity to connect is always with our body. Mm -hmm. It's not a thought simply, it's, it's a body, it's a whole. We connect with all of who we are, right? So in order to um, invite change and to come, come into spaces of change, there needs to be um, readiness in terms of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And um, 
there have to be there's some necessary conditions that coalesce to make possible that we have a states of Nepantla in psychotherapy. And they are regulation, recognition, responsibility, and um, there is a consciousness. Well, guess what? This has to do a lot of a lot with um, trauma work. Um, we can enter those spaces of um, um, change uh, when we are able to deactivate the fight or flight or fight or freeze response. Mm -hmm. The activation of the fight, flight, freeze response is really important. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when we are in that state of fight, flight, or freeze, our capacity to be in relationship, to listen, to change, to see you as whole, to empathize, is limited. And the more limited it is, uh, based on how much fight, freeze, fight, uh, flight, or freeze we have, uh, the less we're going to be able to really be with somebody, right? So, um, Relationally, there needs to be good enough regulation of systems involving hunger, sleep, arousal, social contact, act, affective states, levels of activation, excitation, excitation, exploration, attachment, and attribution of meanings, right? Um, for example, um, um, it's a lot easier to show somebody how they are harming an animal or a child when they are disciplining them physically when the person is in a calm state. If the person is in a state of anger or dissociated, freeze state, they are a lot less available to actually see and feel and take responsibility for the impact of their actions, right? So entering states of change and specifically entering these states of Nepantla involves that um, um, we need to work on regulation, recognition, responsibility, through that consciousness. So the work of decolonization integrates body, cognition, and spirit. Uh, there needs to be a good enough regulation system so that we can engage, so that we can reattach. Mm -hmm. Once uh, we take care of that emotional part in which our system has more regulation, then we're more available to open up to both cognitive and emotional processes in which uh, we can articulate experiences that account for racial, class, gender, and other injustices as a means of healing and empowerment, and that are more attentive um, to the emotional impact of social location. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm talking here about is that there needs to be a scaffolding of how we work in terms of decolonization, first addressing the, um, the traumatic states that we all uh, inhabit, that we all have, and that are probably our normal most of the time, um, and allowing the creation of uh, and teaching of a different kind of regulation, emotional regulation, calmness in our body that feels safe over time, to then engage in the deeper levels of what it means to um, address the injustices that we have suffered as a result of colonization. Mm -hmm. um, so in therapy, it's therapy is not simply about having an interesting intellectual conversation about colonization. No, not at all. It's about first creating a space of bodily regulation and bodily safety that is step-by-step -step pacing it allows us to go to deeper and deeper levels that helps us address the pain that we carry. And that also allows us to see that we can change. That we don't have to continue repeating what we, the only thing I know or what we already know. Um, 
the Mujerista approach, which is was developed by uh, Dr. Lilian Comas Diaz, um, for example, um, does not treat discrimination, aggressions, and microaggressions as something that can be merely resolved with understanding. Um, clients need a safe and nurturing therapeutic relationship and interventions that address the somatic and emotional aspects of everyday and historical wounds of colonization. Clients need emotional regulation to deal with affective intensity, thus individual regulation as well as co-regulation with significant others allows momentary uh, self-organization and co-regulation. Um, example, um, I'm sorry, I'm still here. Um, um, I used to have um, an intense um, freeze, fight, flight response uh, when the police got near me. Uh, why? Because I have had experience of being abused by the police. Mm -hmm. uh, and also because there is a reality about police violence. And I have not only seen it, read about it, but also experienced that, right? So um, in order for me to work on those experiences I had in a safer manner and inhabit all the context I have it in my daily life here, I needed to work to <clears throat> the, the way in which that fight, flight, freeze response became you know, normal for me around police, right? So that I could move to engage with that institution and the people in that institution in a different way. Not from that response, but from a response of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we wanna have regulation. And once we have that emotional regulation and that um, 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 ability to um, calm our nervous system and come back to feeling and inhabiting our bodies, right? Uh, colonization in a way involves uh, not being present in our bodies. And all these dominant discourses around us are a lot about not being present in our bodies because we have to look in a certain way and etc. cetera. So um, decolonization is about coming back to our bodies, valuing our bodies, valuing the color of our bodies, the shape of our bodies, the languages we speak, how we look, how we feel, and coming into acknowledging and, and, and honoring of um, how we are right now, the bodies we have right now. And then recognizing each other, recognizing the beauty, the love, um, the honoring, the respect that we all deserve. Mm -hmm. And then the responsibility that we have to bring this beauty into being in all our interactions. Mm -hmm. And this involves helping people in therapy to see that uh, they, they can show love for each other, that they can say, I love you, that they can be grateful for each other, that they can get to that place. Mm -hmm. And that we all have a part in creating that beauty in our own families, in our workplace. Mm -hmm. So inhabiting these metamorphic spaces, uh, when we think about responsibility, think about, about your workplaces. Do you, how do you bring, for example, um, gratefulness into your workspace? How do you say thank you to the people you're in relationship with at work? Can you do that every day? Can you see them hold as much as you can? And can everybody contribute to that to create a different way of relating with each other? Critical consciousness is about awareness of how personal dynamics unfold within social and political context. Um, awareness of how personal dynamics um, unfold in social and political contexts. Mm -hmm. um, so here, um, the attend to the social location of 
powers with regard to colonization, class, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and foster awareness within these areas, acknowledging that the causes and or consequences of some clinical problems reflect political, economic, and psychological oppression, and that the experiences of oppression require public, institutional, and internal family processes for solution. It is at all these different levels, right? And it helps to differentiate what belongs institutionally, what belongs in the public realm, what belongs in the internal family processes so that people can see what they can control of and what they can't control. Mm -hmm. And the work of therapy, the work of change becomes more doable. Um, so, um, in therapeutic context, uh, involving more than one client, the construction, for example, of um, um, testimonials that foster critical consciousness involve mutual regulation and recognition to help clients carry and flow with transitions of body experience and affect um, where uh, there's listening, accepting of differences, and to some degree that uh, we can um, feel that we can coexist with each other, even if we're not understanding each other at the moment. So um, um, testimonials is, is the, the name and the uh, body of knowledge that has been, was developed in Latin America. And in the Anglo work is what they call narratives. But we've been working with testimonials way before the narrative movement um, in the 90s. And it's basically with testimonials, we're talking about a storytelling in therapy as a valid way and path to describe um, our life, our world. And they are co-constructed. Mm -hmm. And we've in the flow of somatic, experiential, and spiritual work evolving in conversation. We're not, it's not a static, right? So in the therapeutic work, in the work of change, when we are co-creating these testimonials, we have to pay attention to that flow, that flow of uh, regulation of our bodies as we speak, and we take account of how we're feeling and how we're experiencing the here and now, how we're experiencing each other, and how are, we are articulating our stories as we are also aware of how we're impacting each other as we talk, right? So um, in order to talk about some of these um, um, ideas that involve being more critically conscious that are going to bring some level of these regulations, some level of intensity, we have to be, we have to pace ourselves and we have to allow those transitions for um, body and aff affect in the um, listening of difference so that we can coexist, so that we can stay connected even when uh, we don't uh, agree. Mm -hmm. Because there is always tensions, right? So we have to develop uh, more flexibility and more bandwidth to sit with the tensions and stay connected in spite of the tensions, in spite of the disagreements, right? And let's take a deep breath and just see how you're sitting with this at this point. And let me do, now I would like to illustrate what I've been talking about with a clinical case, but I'm going to pause to see what comments we have here or questions. Yes, one of the questions here uh, is Latina or Lat or Latinx. I've seen dialogue that the use of Lat Latinx is rooted in colonist language. Well, <laughs> this is this is a. Um, a complex issue around words, naming, and articulation. So um, I usually really want to encourage people to use the language that feels right to them, uh, based not only on how, you know, what resonates with them, how it sits with them, and also what resonates, what resonates for you in terms of what you have read and the communities, communities that you're in dialogue with. Um, 
um, the Spanish language is very binary. Everything in Spanish is gendered. It's female or male, right? Example, uh, mesa. La mesa is feminine. Mm -hmm. um, el reloj, the watch, is, is masculine. So um, for those of us who inhabit the borderlands of bilinguality and who live in different cultures, it's very complicated to um, navigate these spaces. And I'm trying, I'm doing you know, my best in trying to figure out this every day. Um, I don't have um, an answer because like I said, in Spanish, everything is, is gendered. So um, we're gonna have to, I, I would love to change this. And I hope I can be a witness and this happens in, our, in my lifetime where this changes. Some people don't like the X. Some people want to use an E or E in English. Uh, and instead of saying Latinx, say Latine. Um, okay, great, go ahead, use it. Um, that's fine. The word queer was, you know, has a history like that. It was an oppressive word and it was appropriated and changed and transformed. And now it's a sign of pride. So um, the beauty of this is that um, we can own and create new meaning with these different words and make it make them what we want. Um, and can we coexist and can we value how we want to be named? Um, so I don't have a straight answer for you around this. I think different people call this different ways. Um, some people use an X. Some people in Latin America use the arroba or um, what's the, the at? The symbol. at, yeah. Thank you. The at symbol uh, so that they don't put O or A. Um, I think we're figuring it out. <laughs> the, the next question that's here in the chat. Uh, I have learned about disidentification before, and it has really stuck with me. Could you expand a little more, maybe provide an example? Of what? I've heard about... Disidentification? Disidentification. Okay. Mm -hmm. Disidentification, are you talking about... Um, it, does it say more specifically disidentification of what? It doesn't, but it, it, if if whoever uh, it's an anonymous answer to or question, so if you can clarify, uh, that will help me be able to clarify as well. And then I'll just tell you the next comment that is in here uh, while we wait to see if they have more to, to clarify. Uh, Muriel again said, thinking about how gynecology wouldn't exist without terrorism committed against Black women re relations between colonization and sexual violence and which bodies are valued and not. Yeah, um, I mean, me totally. And this is, I mean, that what you're saying really resonates with me. Um, you know, to me, everything has its place and I don't want to demonize, you know, everything and the medical profession, but there is a part of the medical profession and the med medical history that is horrific. And it's horrific in terms of experimentation on um, African-Americans and people of color. And um, if you think about the medical profession and women, um, it's scary. Uh, if you think about you know, who has created the machines used for investigating our bodies, um, I personally would imagine that if women had created those machines, they would have created different kinds of machines, not what we have today. Uh, why? Because, you know, we embody this anatomy. So um, we have to do better and we have to say no and we have to find alternatives. Thank you. And... Um... They, the person who's clarifying says, it said on one of your slides, disent, disidentification from binaries, maybe? That this person's trying to remember, but can't. Because <laughs> um, <so laughs> there was a question from a while back. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Sorry. So um, um, part of liberation may involve uh, letting go of identifications we no longer want. Hmm? Um, for example, in Colombia, I this is you know I I I honor and I um, 
uh, even though politically this is not necessarily very relevant there, to me it is, but I identify as a person of color uh, in certain political contexts and with appropriateness, of course. Uh, why? Because if I don't do, people are going to make the assumption that I'm part of the majority who um, uh, benefits from the invisibility of being the majority. Mm -hmm. So I don't really want to identify with that because I want to honor actually the sacrifices and the pain of my indigenous and African ancestors that I do have. Uh, I do know I have them. Um, so for me, it's important to say, no, I'm, I'm not exactly part of that. I'm, I'm actually, you know, in connection with you, but I'm also this. Um, now, um, in terms of um, letting go of the legacies of these binaries, um, that is really important in every way, um, in every way, because um, the binary of feminine and masculine um, that we have in place have um, has um, um, it's it's been established in a way in which whatever is male is you know better and dominant or whatever is female, and has brought about destruction in every way um, with the planet. So, um, to me. Um, letting go of that binary in every in every possible way and actually having language for more genders and different genders and having language that takes that out of that box to me that is a sign and is a step of liberation because cognitively it opens up a space for thinking about more possibilities emotionally it challenges us to be more flexible and open to uh, be in connection in relationship with more diversity. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, physically and in terms of embodiment, we have to learn to behave differently in a good way. You know, it will open up possibilities. Mm -hmm. So um, I think those two, you know, this binary is confining and it's extremely problematic in so, so many ways. So, you know, but we do have to start with creating language for all these so that we can articulate our experience in other ways. I have two more here. Uh, Beatrice says, thank you for allowing us to have short breaks after take, talking topics that are, appear so intense. Thank you for doing this training as you cover a wide range of colonialism. Uh, and then that was just a comment. And then a question from Alana. Would you mind speaking a bit more on how colonization is connected to the over-sexualization of Latinas? And if you have any ideas on how it can look like self-colonization in how we present ourselves, especially during young adulthood and when a human is figuring out their sexuality in the first place. Um, sure, thanks for that question. Um, this is an example and it's just a small example of how that can happen. But um, with um, young female identified um, Latinx, um, um, this is sometimes a big, big problem. Um, why? Because oftentimes we live in communities or societies where um, your value is placed on how your body looks and how it looks in a certain way. And because this process of mestizaje has created a construction of, of whiteness where uh, attractiveness looks a certain way. And like I said, it's not about the color, it's about that construction of whiteness, right? Where there are these standards for attractiveness or um, young um, female identified people um, you know, all over Latin America and for Latin uh, communities here. And um, unfortunately, again, in this hierarchy where in which um, women and female identified people over centuries were commodified and really used as a sexual commodity, this is really an extension of that. Um, I know many of my ancestors back some centuries ago were raped because they were sexual commodities, right? And, and in that continuum, what I see today is now 
Well, um, rape can happen again, sexual assaults can happen again, but also we have come to this construction of um, um, creating or making our value um, connected to how our bodies look in a certain way. And we internalize that and then we start to enact how we want to value for being attractive in those ways. Hmm? So, um, you know, the explosion before COVID, I don't know now, but before COVID, the explosion of um, um, plastic, um, um, of, of uh, sur surgeries and plastic surgeries uh, for changing your body so you would be more attractive. And I'm not talking about one part, but every part of your body um, has been tremendous in Latin America. It's a, it was a huge business. Uh, why? Because of this over-sexualization, because people want to look in a certain way. And to me, this is um, internalized oppression um, and, and, you know, that hyper-sexualization that has occurred. Um, that then, you know, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because, um, you know, you, you're supposed to you're, you're wanted, to, wanted for being very attractive, quote unquote, in a certain way, but you're also the object of violence for looking that way. So it really puts us in a really horrible position because you wanna be something, but you're also by being that, the object of aggression. Um, so um, I think being out of, of, of those uh, dominant norms involves um, coming back to connecting with our bodies and coming back to connecting with um, who we are as a people and connecting with the land and really creating communities of resistance against those discourses and against those, against those practices. It's about being healthy and being balanced, but it's not an, it's, it's as individuals, we can do a lot, but I think most importantly is to create communities, collectives of resistance against those practices, against those dominant discourses. Um, and people from different generations can do that. Um, we can give ourselves permission to do that. And then to be valued for what we want to be valued for. Okay, let's just take another pause. And um, let's see how much time I have to just tell you about this, this case I want to share with you and perhaps we close at that point. So take a deep breath in. Feel your body right now. And take a couple of deep breaths, breathing in slowly and breathing out slowly. Now when you're ready, close your eyes and dive in deeper and feel your body and just be aware of what it feels like to be in your body right now. And now take a deep breath and can you allow yourself to be grateful for this beautiful body you have? that functions so well, that is breathing, and your heart is pumping. And there are all these functions that are happening without us even being aware. Can you be grateful to all the cells in your body who are so intelligent and are doing their job so well today? Thank you. So um, I share a lot of broad ideas and I want to illustrate to you how this would look like in a case, in a clinical case. So I'd like to use the next 10 minutes to do that and then 
um, leave some time for more questions and comments. That's okay. Um, so this is it. Um, I mean, I'm just going to highlight some parts of the th this therapy process with um, um, in which I was working with a Latin mother and daughter. So I will highlight three pivotal moments in um, a mother-daughter relationship involving the states of Nepantla and aspects of the therapeutic process in which experiential, testimonial, and spiritual levels coalesced, illustrating the potentials, the ecologies uh, that we brought together as um, humans. So um, Blanca um, was a female identified Latina. Um, she was 46 year old uh, from Mexico and was um, born in a small town and was one of 12 children. Um, her parents worked the land and her mother had a double shift involving work outside and inside the home. She was responsible for taking care of the children, cooking and cleaning, in addition to farming and making artisan sleeping mats for sale. Blanca and her siblings began working at age four. Their duties increased in quantity and complexity as they grew up. They were all expected to contribute in and outside the household in some way after coming back from school. She completed 10th grade. Blanca's family uh, lived in a small shack, one room for everyone with no divisions and the kitchen inside. When she was six years old, her oldest brother sexually abused her and her sisters. The parents were unprotective. Blanca left her family's home very young and partnered with Martin. While initially positive, the relationship turned conflictive and abusive over the years. Martin took a loan with interest to pay for his migration journey to the US. When he could not pay it, Blanca was sent to the US to work to pay his loan and then her loan. Her mother took care of her two children who were eventually sent to the US to join their youngest son. Martin was a hands-off father who provided material security but rarely got involved in his children's activities, set limits and shared his life with them. In addition, he had an affair with um, his sister-in-law and Blanca and Martin eventually divorced. So Blanca's uh, youngest child, Yesenia, she had two born, Mexico and then Yesenia who was born here, um, identified as female and as queer lesbian. And she was 24 when they entered therapy. Um, Blanca was most comfortable speaking Spanish and Yesenia was most comfortable speaking English. However, their knowledge of Spanish and English overlapped enough to allow meaningful conversation without a lot of literal translation. This is a borderland space in therapy. This is what that looks like when we are going back and forth, different languages, different worldviews, and there are, these, there are these overlaps. Blanca and Yesenia were strained due to conflicts over Yesenia's choice of partner and a legacy of family issues. Yesenia, um, grew up with both of her biological parents until age 10. Um, like her mother, she suffered sexual trauma. She was assaulted by a peer in college um, at a party when um, um, there was um, at a party there was alcohol involved and um, she had drunk too much and she could not consent. Um, she attended community college and lived independently uh, with her biracial African-American and white partner, uh, Jesse. At the time, uh, Blanca transitioned to family therapy with Yesenia, because I worked with Blanca individually for a long time, um, um, at least uh, over a year. Uh, Yesenia was also in her own therapy. So uh, Blanca and Yesenia struggled since Yesenia was young due to a clash of strong temperaments, alliances, and conflict with Martin, and challenges around sexual orientation and gender. So therapy with Blanca and Yesenia began 
uh, with the general goal of alleviating ongoing conflicts in communication. As we experientially address what these conflicts involved, they evoke memories of past injuries and ruptures that occurred during Yesenia's childhood and adolescence. From a relational perspective, Yesenia's memories of how she experienced her mother evoke Blanca's memories of how she experienced her own childhood and adolescence. So the first part of therapy involved co-creating a space of, that was safe enough for them to take risk, to be vulnerable with each other, and to experientially address the latest arguments with high emotional intensity that they had by fostering listening and mutual emotional regulation. And mostly what I used there were tools from emotion-focused therapy. By responding to the here and now of their first request, the conflicts they had at the moment, we explored rigid patterns of interaction and negative affect involving emotional disconnection and insecure attachment that exacerbated the situation. I encouraged them to acknowledge their fears and after naming the power differentials in the relationship, I invited them to explore the impact of their actions on each other. This process helped them acknowledge how they were both heard by parents who could not be emotionally present and who wounded them in various ways that oftentimes were passed down from their own parents. Yesenia was able to understand, appreciate, and feel compassion for her mother's spousal relationship. The dysfunction between Blanca and Martin uh, involved Martin's underfunctioning and Blanca's, Blanca's overfunctioning. It seemed that he gave up most of his parental responsibilities except for covering basic physical needs. In this context, Blanca, an overly anxious and traumatized mother, felt she needed to take control over providing the children with a structure and discipline. And this was an almost impossible task with his frequent and passive undermining of her authority. Blanca became the one responsible for her children with very little cooperation for, from Martin. At the same time, um, Blanca empathized with the pain of her daughter and was able to hear how her authoritarian style hurt Yesenia by creating fear and lack of trust in her. Once they were learning to voice their emotional needs and respond to each other with acceptance and compassion, they felt that repair was possible. So this is the process of a scaffold. This is why this takes a little bit of time and we need to pace it. Next, Blanca and Yesenia worked on sharing their testimonials about their childhoods and adolescence. Blanca chose to speak from her heart using candles of various colors as symbols of her feelings and experiences. Yesenia wrote a letter and we moved back and forth in English and Spanish. And with these rituals, we create those Nepantla moments. So the first Nepantla moment emerged with the sharing of testimonials in a ritualized manner. A shift in the conversation occurred when Yesenia brought up the historical pain of female identified persons in her family. In looking at these members' lives, they had compassion for the suffering of a lineage of female identified people who endured oppression inside and outside their families. Following up on generating ecologies of um, understanding, I invited them to bring in through their imagination and via mindfulness, there's these ancestors they were talking about. And some of them showed up um, with many others involving queer and male identified persons. We held space for them in our sessions and together created a simple fire ceremony to honor their pain and their resilience. Blanca consulted with a curandera friend here in the US, um, with, I'm sorry, with her curandera friends here in the US and Mexico, and guided us in regards to the offerings to these ancestors. Yesenia's sisters attended the ritual that we created. This fire ritual generated more space to name and sit with the impact of colonization in their lives. 
in an open fashion, I invited them to acknowledge anyone who needed to be present in this ritual to create a space for potential recognition. Yusenia acknowledged the presence of queer persons in their extended family and discussed the injuries that they suffered as a result of homophobia. Blanca offered um, um, to talk about her brother Ephraim, whom she never talked about. Her brother Ephraim was gay. Um, so this was a really important Nepanta moment that occurred in this ritual where the personal, the ancestral, and the larger history come together to let go, to acknowledge, to honor. Um, in the second Nepanta moment that we have in this therapeutic process, um, Yesenia, this occurred in my office, Yesenia expressed her need to be acknowledged and loved by her mother and other family members as a queer person. The intensity heightened greatly as Blanca and Yesenia discussed how her sisters and other relatives would respond, as well as their views on homosexuality and queerness. Blanca shared prejudice, beliefs embedded in her Catholic upbringing, and Yesenia questioned the roots of those beliefs asking her mother to consider how, in her view, the Bible denies existence to anyone who is not binary and sets Eve up to a path of shame and guilt and inferiority. Blanca shared how her fear of God, priests, and hell was instilled in her as a child. Although the emotional temperature rose, they were able to temporarily tolerate it. Blanca shared in tears that her brother Ephraim um, had been rejected from his family and isolated because he was attracted to me and she lost contact with him. Uh, while this conversation stayed at the level of experience, it helped him to invite connections with social issues involving violence against queer people, raising Blanca's critical consciousness about the contributions of the Catholic Church to colonization in regards to female and queer identified persons. At this time, Blanca was ready to take responsibility for her own homophobia and the ways in which she hurt Yesenia over the years by making her queerness invisible. Furthermore, they were both able to see and emotionally release the burden of carrying homophobia in their family as a result of the patriarchal order established in colonization. Blanca used herbal baths to cleanse and release this burden and this was both a choice based on understanding and the somatic experience. This is a borderlands, basically. Yesenia chose to hike to a mountain and make an offering in the form of a bundle of herbs. Yesenia and Blanca achieved momentary states of mutual regulation and influence each other's views of the other by understanding their personal experiences of trauma and the ties of these experiences with violent social forces in different generations in the family. Um, I'm gonna pause here because I'm just looking at time and I have 1046 and I have another piece of this, but I wanna stop in case we wanna stop here and, and have some comments and, and questions. Let's just check. Um, did you have slides that you were sharing along with this one? Um, no, this is okay. just a case. Great, um, just a question. The, the last two slides, we're not gonna get to them. Um, so I won't be sharing more slides. And um, there is a list of reference in the slides that when people get the slides, they can access them. And then Cecilia says, loving this conversation. Thank you, a lot of validation and education on systems perspective. This is very helpful to offer authenticity, opening space for others to do the same. Mm, thank you. Would you like me to share the third Nepanta moment? Or do you want to have conversation? Let me share this last paragraph and then give five more minutes for conversation. So there's another big shift that happened in this therapy process that was very beautiful I want to share with you. And um, this third Nepantla moment occurred in the relationship that Blanca and Yesenia had with work. As described uh, before, um, Blanca was socialized to labor before, before she could even speak clearly. Um, her body grew exposed to the routine of lots of work and little play. 
Contemporary neuroscience reminds us that genetic inheritance directs the overall organization of the brain and experience influences how, when, and which genes will become expressed. Blanca's genes and experiences contributed to the formation of her brain and mind. As with any other human, her genetic makeup influences specific connections in the brain and her experience, which activates her neurons, shapes connections in her brain through the formation of synapses and new neuronal growth. Mental processes shape neural connections, which in turn shape mental processes. So imagine how this little child starts, little girl starts to work at age four and how her brain and her body get adapted to little play and work, and lots of work. And all the connections in her brain that develop and think about all the connections that don't develop because there's no play or very little play. Mental processes shape neural connections, which in turn shape mental processes. Lanka worked and took care of others her whole life, since she was four. This is how she knew how to live. This is how she knew how to survive. This is what she was wired, the way she was wired. So her relationship with work was deeply ingrained in her cells and offered her many benefits, including emotional release. Um, she just worked when she was stressed out. As an immigrant, on top of that, she worked very hard to create a small and successful cleaning business that later allowed her to enjoy a degree of comfort that she never had before. Yesenia was born and grew up in a home in which her parents worked and she went to school and she and her sisters shared a home. Very different environment from Blanca. She got her first job assisting others at a Mexican restaurant at age 16. She held other jobs, including working with her mother, and in all her jobs, she was paid for her labor. Blanca was not paid. Um, she was able, as a you know, child and adolescent, she was able to rest and socialize with peers, and she had regular continued opportunities for play and connection with others within a working class context. That's Jesenia. Given that their relationship with work evolved in such different ways, it was not surprising that Blanca expected Yesenia to work more, earn more, and contribute to help some of their family members in Mexico. Of course. And Yesenia, trained as a veterinary assistant and derived a lot of satisfaction from her work at a local veterinary clinic. She loved animals, and she and Jesse had a dog and a cat. Oftentimes, she supplemented her income with pet sitting. Yesenia and Jesse shared their finances and were able to sustain themselves with their incomes. Yesenia declined her mother's invitations to join her cleaning business and rarely contributed to helping relatives in need. In the past, their arguments around work expectations and productivity were heated, especially when Blanca needed help, and Yesenia refused. So the therapy process moved to an Epanta state with Blanca and Yesenia. When I asked them to mindfully sit with work, quote unquote work, as an entity outside of them. Um, having prepared my office space with sage, I invited them to offer their, their senses to, um, to smell, and just to feel the space. I then proceeded to ask them to sit with the smells of work and it stimulated a sensual and visual connection with settings and their smells. When we converse about what various workspaces smelled and how they experienced them, a lot of things came up. This brought up a rich conversation about the smells of the land versus the smells of offices and relationships with non-human beings, including plants and domestic animals. The emotional temperature flattened when Blanca's testimony addressed all the caretaking responsibilities that brought her from the possibility to play as a child. Her tears fell deep, like rising from her womb. It seemed as if for the first time, Yesenia realized the ways in which colonization made her mother useful until no longer useful. 
She articulated out loud how her mother's strength was exploited by the systems that create poverty and exclusion, her own family, and the US dominant culture of productivity and consumerism. At the same time, she appreciated how this strength helped her survive and gave her children a different life. In this state of Nepantla, mother and daughter listen to each other and discuss their very different, different relationship with work and productivity. Yesenia invited her mother to experiment with the small actions of care for self and enjoyment, and Blanca invited Yesenia to share more in helping her aging grandparents. They discussed differences around familiar responsibility, leisure, and the meaning of money. Yesenia acknowledged that she felt embarrassment in regards to her mother's occupation as it was emblematic of Latinx immigrant work and in her experience a target of hostility from peers. This Neplanta space culminated with another uh, little fire ceremony that we did with candles in which they honored ancestors who were forced into indentured labor and later those who were forced to survive using their children as labor. They hope for a spiritual release of those who came before them and those who will come after them. And they release themselves from the current painful aspects of work, inviting transformation in this relationship. So as you see, work relationship with work for these two women was deeply entangled with so many layers of very different experience of colonization and decolonization. And through that, working out what that meant and the experiences they had, they were really able to transform a deep part of their relationship. Okay, so let's pause. Let's take another deep breath and just, just sit with this case in what we just heard for a couple of breaths and then we'll hear comments and questions. Hmm. Okay, let's land here. Okay, so we have a few more minutes here for questions or comments. How is this landing with you? How is this sitting with you? What's emerging for you? I see here, I see here Blanca saying gracias, con mucho gusto. Gracias a ti por venir. What is your best tip for discussing colonization with adopted family? <laughs> uh, well, it depends. I mean, I, I think I always pay attention to readiness and willingness. How you enter this conversation, it's really going to depend on where people are at. And um, we have to look, look at if people are ready and in what people are ready to hear. Um, if people are not ready to hear, they're not going to hear us. So um, I oftentimes ask for help from all my guardians and, and helpers, ask for help for, for speaking in a way in which I can be heard. I ask for help to speak in a way in which others can hear me. Uh, do you do group virtual therapy, individual therapy? I mostly work with couples and individuals. Um, I do, um, I supervise interns and I have a group for um, supervision of interns. I have a question here from anonymous. Uh, asker. Sure. Uh, I was thinking about cultural appropriation and how it can tie into colonization. Like with the Kardashians, how they darken their skin and hair to look like people of color and then go on have plastic surgery to look more sexual. Would you consider that contributing to colonization and hypersexuality of BIPOC? Uh, well, the topic of cultural appropriation, it's a very complex and complicated topic. Um, 
to be honest with you, I'm of a generation where the Kardashians mean nothing to me, and I actually don't know much about them. So um, I'm going to claim ignorance about what these people do, because I'm not interested, and I don't want to engage with that, and I just don't care. Um, I don't want them to be a part of my life. But I, I think what you're raising, it's a very valid point in terms of how, um, um, you know, different ways of looking, different ways of being are taken and, and let's say kidnapped by marketing, by corporations, by media, and by, you know, all these people uh, to make us hostage of buying their products. That's how I see it. So, um, I, to me, it's an act of resistance to refuse to engage in that and buying that and listening to them or giving any energy to that kind of thing. Um, now, the, the issue of cultural appropriation is, is complicated because um, while there's some situations in this, you know, it's very clear that, you know, people, people are doing what they always do, extracting from um, our lands and then taking it here and then, um, you know, pat creating patents as has happened with plants. You know, people go take plants in Latin America, in South America, in Colombia, and then they try to create patents here. Um, it's absolutely outrageous and it's more of what has happened for more than 500 years. But then there is these other situations in which there is these borderland spaces and overlappings of culture where um, it's more complicated to decide who can claim what and under what circumstances. And I think that for me, it's important to have, um, uh, you know, um, more openness to understanding those complexities. Um, because if we go with the thinking that only some people can claim certain things and you have to prove that you are, you know, a certain kind of person, that um, that's going to create a lot of marginalization for all the people, for example, like me, who are the product of the wound of colonization. As mestizos are the wound of colonization. We are the product of the sexual assaults. Hmm? Well, I see it's 11. So I want us to invite us to just we, we bring closure with something, something positive again, something to be grateful for. Let's all take a big breath. And uh, right now there is 53 people here. There were like 69 before, but now we have 53. And let's imagine that we are connecting through a circle and we're holding hands. And as we're holding hands, close your eyes and take a deep breath. And take another big breath and let's synchronize each other to our breath. And thank each other for being present here for each other. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your presence in my life today. Thank you. Now take another deep breath and bring to your awareness something else you're thank you, thankful for right now. Whatever comes to mind, maybe that nice cup of coffee you had this morning, maybe the light of the sun. Mm. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much uh, to the coalition, to Carolina um, for um, this invitation. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm very grateful uh, that you allowed me this space to be with you today. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Dr. Hernandez Wolf. Uh, this is also her book that I'm holding here. <clears throat> so if you, uh, you know, are interested to learn more and delve deeper into the clinical pieces, uh, you can find it here. Um, and um, this will be recorded. You'll get a, um, so you're able to look at it later.